Kenneth Williams has been dead for six years, but his elfin witchcraft is still alive. So carry on Ken again, here in Melissa Rames' South Bankshire film, which unblinkingly assembles, or as he might have drawled, entwines his public and his very private parts. I think we're here to entertain, as we're here to do, to get laughs. Barbara, dear, do you think you're quite suitably dressed? Oh. That's quite enough of that, thank you. What's the matter with you? You told us this film was all about camping. Well, it is. Oh, I do feel queer. It's disgusting, that's what it is, disgusting. What are you talking about, disgusting? It's artistic. Remember the famous one with the bra coming off? Oh, How did I get the bra? Oh, <laughs> Come on, Anthea. Are you two coming as well? Wait a minute, let's see the end. I suppose we'd better go with them, see? Yeah. Excuse me. It makes you sick. You just don't appreciate culture. Now, with a mind you, I'm a cult figure. Hello, Kenneth. Well, then, did it for me. You had this uh, feeble body with a rather fruity voice. Matron? What is it? What do you want? You could say that certainly stands for England. <laughs> I was born in London on the afternoon of February 22nd in the year of the General Strike, 1926. My mother said... I remember the time because your father had the afternoon free because of the early closing day. It all happened in a house in Bingfield Street off the Caledonian Road. It was a slum, all right. Three or four families in one house. This wasn't serious, a poor area of London. No bathroom, of course. We had a tin tub which used to hang on the scullery door. When my father got his own hairdressing shops, we moved into rooms above it in Marchmont Street. We came and lived over the premises, and I went up in the world. My father was a cockney. No, he didn't talk like me at all. No, he hated my kind of talk. He was a wooden guy rather plowing in there for. <laughs> Why should his magnificence take any interest in Angelo's father? You people want to make him responsible for everything. Well, I don't mind admitting I admired Medici. Well, I wasn't his nice ears at all. I think. <laughs> You're the one! You're the traitor! That's enough! As a child, I was a prince. I used to drape the eyelid down round myself and walk round the room and say to people, Call me your bun ship. What an ill-bred young man. You wish to speak to me, Tizio? Yes, sir. Kenneth becoming an actor. Tell and tell slightly camp with them that didn't appeal to his father, there. Charlie, at all. My boy's got to be, you know, put boxing gloves on, you know. I wish he gave him, I, I'm told, um, uh, some boxing gloves. And Kenneth looked at the boxing gloves and said, What am I supposed to do with these? My father had no time for anything fancy, you know. I mean, a man I remember once came into the shop. Oh, I'd like a blow wave. And he said, blow? You'll get no blow waves from me. I'm not doing no blow waves. Why are you? Blow in iron. Iron off. Iron. I'm not having no irons in my shop. Get out. It was so full with aircraft and nothing. He was a very, very cockney man. And um, very rough. And uh, used to always be blasting away about Ken's puffy friends, you know. How, how, did, he how did he cope with Kenneth and his puffy friends, then? Well, largely by coming in and saying, hey, who have you got here? Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of puffs here. And you'd be sitting there thinking, do I really have to put up with this? You know? it, was, um, it was very uh, barbaric in a way. It was very direct and to the point. And that's what I think Ken used in his comedy. You have? Well, shut your face up! <laughs> he attacked all the time. If anybody dared to suggest that he was any kind of Nancy boy, boy right or something, here. you know, there would be the voice and the face would come on, you know. In contrast to his relationship with his father, Kenneth Williams was unusually close to his mother, Louie. They lived either next door to each other or together until his death and shared a similar outlook and sense of humour. As they walked through the door, this extraordinary dialogue began between them and it carried on until they left without pause, without stopping. And it was like seeing somebody talking to themselves. Not jokes, but just talking about the family, the granny and the grandfather, and Auntie Maud and Auntie Hilda and Brother George. Hysterically funny stories, all obviously true. When my gran died, the funeral cortege slowed in respect as it passed her house. But it came to a halt outside the pub where she'd been such a good customer. The landlord came out with his tribute, the gates of heaven ajar. That infuriated my Aunt Alice, who'd already bought an identical wreath. 
Only the family should give the gates of Ebon a jar, she kept saying. The whole day was a riot of confusion. One of the mourners actually managed to drop her handbag in the grave. Kenneth Williams' mother was an old duck, as we would, Londoners would say, and a delightful woman. At the time we were recording round the horn, my wife was pregnant, and uh, every week Louis and her sister would turn up to the recording with a little box, and in the box would be something, a pair of booties or matinee jacket, whatever, and she'd say to my wife, Lynn, she'd say, it's something for the baby. She didn't like me, but I think she thought... Why didn't she like you? Well, I think she thought I was a bit of a threat to him, because he liked me, you see. Like, for instance, I read something in newspapers, and I said, I only like three ladies. So they said to him, well, out of those three ladies, if you could marry any of those ladies, who would it be? So he said, hmm, oh, it'd be Barbara Windsor. But anyway, I phoned him out, I said, Kenny, that, that's so kind what you said, darling, you know, about me. He said, oh, don't get your hopes up, darling. He said, there'd be no sex. You see, which I, I think is wonderful, but when I, his mother, whenever I saw his mother, she'd always go, oh, yes, and he always dismissed me, and I think maybe that was because when he came on my first honeymoon with me, with Ronnie Knight, we... I'm How did he manage to come Oh, I know, I know, there. darling. Well, it was at the end of, of Carry On Spine. Even so, at the end of... Could have been the end of... Uh, <laughs> It could have been the end of Antony and Cleopatra. How did you take Kenneth uh, Williams on your Well, it was just that we became such good friends. And he said to me, what are you doing after we made this film? And I said, well, actually, I'm going on my honeymoon. Do you like my outfit? Yeah. Ronnie hates it. I got all dressed up. I said, how do I look? He said, you're not wearing that. You're not going dressed like that, are you? It's not such as in the pen, am I? I had a little tear this morning. <laughs> oh. Anyway, I introduced him to Ronnie. Next thing I knew, I was going on holiday honeymoon with him. What he didn't tell me, though, he was bringing his sister Pat and his mother Lou along as well, you see. It was just a, it was a whole disaster, the whole holiday. And uh, this, this flight, and then you arrive and you have to get a, a boat across to the island. It all sounds so romantic, but it wasn't. It was one of those awful ferries that you go on with, with all the locusts and all the cattle and all the chickens and, and pigs and dogs. It's full of character, Mum. Uh, yeah, I know. But, uh, and if the thing is, it was all in. All, all your, your, it was all into um, uh, the flight and the ferry and and. So and you couldn't get course, off. Yes, and the three course meal, and of course we we hit. What do you call it? There was a hurricane and going up. Big waves. Oh, big big, big, yeah. big waves, and there was Ronnie Knight holding it hanging over the side, and I was holding onto his legs, and he's saying, let me die, and all this, and Kenny yelling out, it's all in the mind, Ronnie, it's all in the mind, and then he suddenly said to his waiter, they ran out of sick bags, and he said to this waiter, um, where's my three-course meal? And the waiter said, oh, senor, please, we cannot say no, we don't, no, no, why are you gastronomic goon, you're the whole shit, to know you're seasick? No, no, no. I've all, it's all in the ticket, it's all inclusive, and there's little Lou saying, yes, my Kenny wants his three-course meal, you see, and he made them serve this food. He, he made them. It was awful. She, had, she exercised a powerful control on his life. Well, How would you describe sweet it? sweet little lady, this, this darling sweet little lady. You'd have think, thought, though, she was the mother of Ronnie and Reggie Cray, because she, she did exercise this great authority over him, you know, and... Uh, and it was all, Lou wants this, and Lou must have the best seat in all his radio shows. You know, had to sit in a special seat, and uh, everything was for Lou. She was quite a small woman. I mean, she didn't look awfully like him, but um, very sharp, witted. The sort of occasion, I think, that really startled me was when I came into the salon. Mrs. Williams said, uh, you've got a television then, have you? And, I, uh, uh, and this other barber said, yeah, I've got a 19-inch console. And Mrs. Williams said, 19 inches, that'd console anyone, wouldn't it? 